You know, we've been in a series on 1 Timothy for several weeks now. And uh, we learned about being spiritual sons and daughters. We, we learned that, you know, we're a family in Victory Outreach. Can I hear you say amen? We want you to know if you're here for the very first time that we're not just a church. We're a movement. We're an army of God, but we're also a family. And we love you and we love one another. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we're, we're spiritual sons and daughters. Secondly, we learned about, about taking care of the message, being faithful to the message that God has given us. Come on, somebody. How I many know we have a message for the inner cities of the world? We got a message for the lost and hurting people in our communities, in our, in our city, and around the world. We have, to, we have to be faithful to that message. Amen? Thirdly, we learned about the power of our testimony. How many of you have a testimony this morning? Are you taking care of that testimony? Are you guarding it? Because when your testimony is pure, when your testimony is faithful, when your testimony is anointed, lives can be touched for God's honor and God's glory. And last week we talked about, we were on Zoom last week because of the weather, right? How many of you couldn't get your car out last week? Right, so we, we decided just to not come to, to the sanctuary, but to go on Zoom, and it went pretty good. We had a good crowd, and we talked about the battle, right? We had, we had a powerful, powerful time talking about the battle, right? Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight. There's a lot of bad fights that we could fight. Come on, somebody. But we have to fight the good fight. And when we're fighting and we're contending for souls, when we're battling for the souls, for the lives of people, when we're, when we're going before God and we're going out to the streets and we're winning souls, how many know we're fighting the good fight of faith? Amen? This morning, we're going to go into chapter 2. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles or they're going to put it up on the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to start chapter 2 this morning. And we'll begin right there at verse number 1. When you have it, say, I have it. First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. Look what Paul says. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, somebody say one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. How many know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? No one can come to the Father except by him, right? There's only one God. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself, watch this, he gave himself as a ransom for all of us. He paid the price, the penalty of our sin, Jesus paid on the cross. It says, which is the testimony given at the proper time, for this is, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. This morning, what we're going to talk about in this, beginning with chapter 2, we're going to talk about the priority of prayer. The priority of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We worship you. And we ask right now, God, that you just open up our hearts and our minds, God. That you would minister to us, God. And God, that you would do something in us that we would understand the importance and the place of prayer in our lives, in our church. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, just move today and touch people today, even those viewing online, touch them. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, Friday night, we get together for our Friday night fire, right? And God's really doing something powerful on those Friday night fire services. Have you been enjoy, enjoying them? It's been a powerful time. But last Friday, I got to be honest, last Friday, 
the women of the church took it to another level. Come on. Come on, guys. I don't know about you, but I was learning some stuff. I was learning. I was, I was listening to the message. Sister Meyer spoke a message, a powerful, powerful message on the blessings of Abraham. And then the women, my God, when, when the women came up to pray, there was such a passion. There was such an anointing. I mean, when they started praying and they started, I told my wife on the way to church, when they started speaking in their heavenly language during prayer, I sensed the anointing. I sensed the power. I, I sensed revival breaking forth. Come on, ladies. We got some praying on fire women of God in our church. And it was a powerful time. And then what we've been doing every Friday night, then praying, we were doing it, we were doing it online, and then now we opened it back up. So we want to let everybody know, you got to come out. There's nothing like being in the presence of God's people when we come together for prayer. And that's what Paul is talking about here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first few verses. I want to read you a quote before I get into uh, the, the word. This is from A.W. Tozer. If you, ha if you haven't read any books by A.W. Tozer, you need to find some. Anything he writes is a good book to read because it'll deal with you and it'll cause you to want to get before God. But look at what A.W. Tozer says. He says, to pray successfully is the first lesson the man or woman of God must learn. If he or she is to live fruitfully, yet prayer is the hardest thing they will ever be called upon to do. Now, maybe there's some people here that have the gift of intercession, and prayer just comes easy to you, because that's your spiritual gift. You love to just get before, you can stay in prayer for hours at a time, but for most of us, for most of us, it doesn't come naturally. A.W. Tozer goes on to say, it's the hardest thing you'll ever be called to do. And being human, how many of us are human? It is the one act you will be tempted to do less frequently than any other. I mean, we can come to church, we can sing songs, we can, we can do a lot of stuff. We can, we can usher, we can go to the streets and pray for people, we can, we can do all the different functions in the church, everything we're, we're doing, all the different ministries. Something about just stopping everything. We're good at being like Martha. Come on, Martha was busy preparing, doing. We're, 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 we're good at doing. But how many know there comes a time in all of our lives where Jesus wants to stop everything. And he just wants you to be still in his presence. Amen. And seek him and cry out to him and listen for his voice. A.W. Tozer says it's the one act we will be tempted to do less frequently than any other. So we must set our heart to conquer by prayer. How many know we can conquer the things of the world, the devil, the flesh, by prayer? By prayer. And that will mean that he must first conquer our own flesh. Wow, when I was reading this, I, I started getting, I felt, I felt, convicted I didn't feel guilty but I felt convicted for it is the flesh watch this that always hinders prayer how many of you by giving a hand clap could say yeah that's true this flesh this flesh this body it doesn't like to bend down it doesn't like to humble Timothy is on an assignment from the Apostle Paul his job was to show, model, be an example, and teach the people how to conduct themselves in the house of God. Let me ask you a question. Where are we at this morning? We're in the house of God. Wherever, wherever we gather, wherever we come together, we're in the house of God. This, this is the house of God. When I'm at home and me and my wife are together, that's the house of God. When I'm in life group on Wednesday night, that's the house of God. When we're on Zoom, that's the house of God. Wherever the people of God come together, even if there was no building and we met together on a street corner. How many know in, in our victory outreach in Havana, Cuba, 
That's how they started the church. They met outside for a long time until they got a building. But wherever we go and we come together, we're in the house of God. Why? Because we're all living stones being built up into a temple. When everybody comes together, we make the temple of God. So Paul gave Timothy a couple assignments. The first one was to teach the people and correct them concerning false teaching. I mean, you know, there's a lot of false teaching going around. And it's important that we learn doctrinal and we learn ministry principles and values. It's important that we have a doctrinal foundation, but it's important that we also have principled living that we abide by, absolutes, values that we live for. So his first assignment that Paul gave to Timothy was to correct false teaching. That's how he was going to teach the people how to conduct themselves in the house of God. Can you imagine if everybody believed something different? How difficult it would be. People would be arguing. People would be debating. People would be quarreling. People wouldn't be talking to each other. But when we all have one faith, one Lord, one baptism, we're all moving in unity of vision, how many know that is a good sign? Amen. The second assignment that Paul gave to Timothy, and we find that here in chapter 2, the first one we, we saw in chapter 1, but the second assignment Paul gave to Timothy was the set in order the public worship of the church. This is what we call a public worship service. We're not hiding. Anybody can come in. Come on, somebody. Any, everybody's welcome in the house of God. It's, a, it's open to the public. It's open to you. If you want to come, the church is open. And Timothy's job, just like the job of the pastor, the job of the leader, was, is to set in order the public worship of the church. That's what we're trying to accomplish when we come together. Let's, let's, let's teach God's people how to come together and worship the Lord. So the first thing Paul does in doing this and in, in setting the order of public worship, the first thing Paul does is he tells Timothy to teach the people how to pray. Teach the men and women. How many know you can never learn enough, enough about prayer. Because I know already some of you are already tuning out. You might even be trying to get on the, the internet and check out what's going on on Super Bowl Sunday. Get on ESPN. You might be flicking through the channels because you're saying, oh, prayer, I know how to pray. I'm here today to tell you, you can never stop learning about prayer. Because prayer is where we communicate with God. Prayer is where we hear from God. And God has so much more for us to learn. So the first thing Paul tells Timothy to do in his letter, he lists the priority of public prayer. Now you say, well, what is public prayer? What do you mean? What do you mean public prayer? Besides me just saying we all come together and we pray. That's good, yeah, but here, here's a little deeper definition of public prayer. Public prayer involves the people of God how many of you say, I'm, I'm the people of God? Lift up your hand if you say, I'm the people of God. It involves the people of God encountering God. Come on, somebody. Encountering God on behalf of themselves, their fellow Christians, and people all around the world. When we come together and pray, I don't know about you, but when I pray, when I come together to a prayer meeting and I'm getting in, in the prayer, whether it's at my house or on Zoom on Saturday or on Friday night in the church or making an altar call, I want to have an encounter with God. I want to have an I want to experience another level. I want a fresh touch of God. How about you? So it involves the people of God encountering God on behalf of themselves, their fellow Christians, and people all around. How many know our prayers can touch people in Africa? Think about that. Our prayers, you know, we just came out of a, a pandemic, right? And people were getting sick and going to the hospital, and they weren't letting family members visit them. 
right? You couldn't go into the hospital. But how many know nothing can stop our prayers? Not, we learned that in the Bible, where, where the Bible says, you sent your word and healed our diseases. There, when we pray, God can manifest himself here, but God can also manifest himself out there. I want you to remember that, because we're going to pray for our lost loved ones and the lost people of our city today. I want you to remember that, that your prayers don't stop here in the church. But they have a far-reaching effect. And Paul was teaching that. He was teaching Timothy the, the, the importance and the priority of prayer. And it wasn't just something that you do inside of the house of God. But it's something that can touch people all around the world. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have someone on your prayer list that you pray for daily? There's a couple that I pray for all the time. You know, God put them on my heart, that, and he laid it on my heart. I'm their intercessor. I'm their intercessor. I pray for them. I, I pray they struggle with, with their physical health real bad. And God laid it on my heart, you know, that just pray, just intercede for them. Intercede, lift them up for, for, for every day. When you go before me and you go automatically into worship, you go into plea in the blood, you go into, you know what, praying for your family. Remember this couple. How many of you have someone like that that you have in your heart that you're praying for? If you don't, you need to ask God to give you someone. See, prayer is a very, very relevant subject for us. We need, we need it. It's very, very relevant. That's actually why we come together. Yeah, we want to hear the word of God, but we want to see God move. We want to see God move, and nothing moves the hand of God like prayer. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said there's one way to move men, through God, through prayer. There's one way to move men, through God, through prayer. You got some unsaved loved ones? You got some rebellious teenagers? You got a family member that has a need. There's one way to move men, and that's through God, through prayer. That's why we come together. We should always, every time we come together in service, every time we come together in Bible study, even when we go to the streets, everything we do should begin with prayer. Do you agree with me? If you agree with me, come on, give me a hand clap. Come on, put those hands together if you agree. Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20. Why don't you turn there real quick? It says this. This is, this is why I'm talking about the importance of prayer when we come together. It says, again, I say to you. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to you. He's talking to me. Come on, somebody. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth, where are we at right now? We're on earth, right? About anything they ask. Come on, somebody. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three, how many are here? More than two or three, right? Are gathered together in my name. There I am among them. I wonder who Jesus is sitting next to this morning. Because he's here. He's here. He says, when well, there's two or three gathered together in his name, he's there among us. He says, if two of you agree on earth, you ever heard to have someone tell you, hey, brother, sister, agree with me in prayer on this. Come in agreement with me in prayer on that. How many know it's important that we get people praying with us? We get people praying for us. We come in agreement with one another. See, public prayer... Is, very, is a very revealing indication of what's going on in the church and what's going on in our life. I can watch. I can watch our sheep. And I can make a good, a pretty good observation, maybe not all the time, but I can watch the sheep during prayer time, during worship time, and I could see who's troubled. I could see who's distracted. 
I could see who's hurting. I could see who's rebelling. Pretty much, prayer is a very good indicator of the church, of what's going on in the church, and what's going on in our life, in my life. So why should prayer matter to us? Why, what's, what's all this about, the priority of prayer? Why did Paul bring that? I mean, he spent almost half of the chapter talking about prayer, right? He goes right into it. Why should prayer matter? Let me give you four things. Write them down real quick. This is not my message, but go ahead and take these four. It's free. Prayer should matter to us, number one, because it causes a daily surrender of our lives. How many of you got up this morning and you got up before you came to church and you went into prayer? Now, it's easy to tell yourself, well, I'm going to pray when I get to church. Or it's easy to tell yourself when you get to church, I already prayed at home. How many of you ever had those thoughts? Come on, I'm sure you have. But what prayer does, prayer causes a daily surrender of our lives. Any opportunity we get to pray, we should take it. Because when we pray, we're bowing down in the presence of a holy God. Remember, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. Where two of you agree here on earth, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. Number two. Another reason why prayer should be important is prayer puts the focus off of here. Come on. And it puts the focus on God. It's the, it's the one place where I'm not thinking about, worrying about. Come on, so it's the one place where anger, where, where jealousy, where perversion, it's the one place where none of that stuff can touch. It takes the focus off of here and it puts it on God. This crazy world, this, this messed up world, the worries and the cares of this world seem to just move away when the people of God pray. Do you, does that happen to you? Number three, another reason why prayer should be important is prayer involves personal sacrifice. And how many know sacrifice is good? The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of sacrifice. The Bible says he came to give his life as a ransom or a price, a sacrifice for all of us. So prayer, it, it involves personal sacrifice. You know, it, it just, it takes a little more effort for the man or the woman of God to stop everything and pray. Because we, we want to see stuff happen. We want to have, we want to have a productivity. We want to, we want to get things moving. We, and, and to stop everything and just say, no, let's stop. Let's pray. My wife is such a great cook. Now, why are you saying that? Why are you bringing up food in the middle of a message on prayer? I'm going to tell you why. Because she, she gets the food, and it looks so good. She plates it, and she takes pictures of it and videos of it. Then she sets it down, and, you know, then we, we sit down to eat, and the first thing I want to do is just dig in. Well, she always reminds me, did you pray? Did you, let me ask you a question. Do you pray before you eat? How many of you remember praying for traveling mercy? Do you still pray for traveling mercy? I will tell you this. With all the madness going on in Chicago, all the carjackings, I think we all need to get in our prayer, in our car and pray now. And the camp angels around it. Prayer involves personal sacrifice. It takes a little more. You got to put things on hold when you pray. And then lastly, number four, why prayer should be important to you and I is because prayer 
is a celebration of God's goodness. Can you just lift up your hands and just, just for 20 seconds, just celebrate God's goodness and just thank him and worship him and praise him and say hallelujah, glory to God, you've been good. Let's go back to verse 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2. Look what Paul says. Let me read it one more time. He says, first of all, everybody say first of all. Then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in a high positions or authority, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. How many of you want to live peaceful, quiet, godly, and dignified? I think that's the life that God, I think that's part of the abundant life. Godly, dignified, peaceful, quiet, right? Just peace and quiet. I just want some peace and quiet. Well, start praying because that's how you get it. Look what Paul says. Paul says, first of all, in other words, Timothy, this is how, this is how you're going to order your service. This is how, this is how you're going to start your day, first of all. First of all, that word first of all to Paul it meant prayer was the most important thing in a public service. Not the message, right? Not the singing, right? Not the fellowship. All those things are important, but the most important. Like Jesus told Martha, but what Mary has chosen is the most important thing. Prayer is the most important aspect of a public worship service to you and i here today it should mean that everything we do should begin in prayer you should start your day in prayer start your day before you do anything get up and pray jesus said this to his disciples how many of us believe we're disciples today to his followers he said seek first the kingdom of god put god first through prayer seek him Another writer said this, the secret of a happy life or a blessed life. Come on, how many of you want to live a blessed life? How many of you want to live a happy life? I, I don't know about you. I want, to, I, want, I want to live under the blessings of Abraham. I want to live the blessed life. And the secret of a blessed life is giving God the first part of your day. The first priority of every decision and the first place in your heart. Like my wife said about Abraham, when God spoke to him and God called him to leave the Ur of Chaldea and to go to Canaan, God told him this also. He said, I want you to go to a place, I'll tell you. In other words, I ain't telling you where you're going. Just step out and obey my voice and I'll tell you when you get there. That's kind of how we are. That's kind of how we are. God doesn't give us a whole plan up front, but he says, just follow me. Come follow me. Seek me. That's how you live a blessed life. It's not possessions. It's not things. It's God first. Can you say that with me? God first. God first is doing what he wants us to do over what we want to do. Oh, man. So many times we choose what we want to do first. And many times what we want to do isn't what God wants us to do. Putting God first is doing what he wants us to do over what we want to do, even if it seems like our way is better. I like the way John the Baptist said it. He said, I must decrease so Jesus can increase. See, what the beautiful part about prayer is prayer is where we die to self. Prayer is where we put our agenda to the side and we embrace God's purpose. So Paul the Apostle says, first of all, he's telling the church the priority of prayer in your life should be at the top of the list. Prayer has to be at the top of the list. It, it, you know, when we put God first, when we put God first, it makes, I, I'm telling you, when we're praying and we're seeking God as a congregation, when everybody is in one accord and everybody's together and, and nobody, you know, everybody's prayed up. Because I mean, you know, when you're prayed up, you're in your right mind, your heart is right. The devil can't lie to a person who's prayed up. 
It makes a church service different from any other gathering. When we're prayed up, when we're seeking God, this service is so much different from any other gathering we could have. There's an anointing. There is a presence. When God is recognized first as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that he is there in our midst, it changes everything. When you and I recognize, can you imagine the power that will be poured out? We all say we want to have, we want to have revival like this church or like that church, or we want that early church experience. Well, you know what those churches do? From the, from the head to the whole body, everyone is seeking the face of God before anything. You know, we get together every Saturday morning on Zoom. How many of you join us on Saturday morning? Some of you, I see your picture, <laughs> right? Every Saturday morning at 8 a.m., we have prayer together on Zoom, right? And that's been a powerful, powerful time. But I think we can have a lot more people joining in. I think, I, I think a lot more of us, could, can you imagine what will take place if all of us are locking in on Saturday morning and we're prioritizing prayer. Can you imagine on Friday night, Friday night fire, right? Friday night fire service here, 7.30 p.m. every Friday night. What do we do? We pray. The, we come together. It's a gathering where we just put God first in prayer. Like I mentioned, something happened. Something The last few weeks, something's been happening tremendously. There's a revival. There's a stirring taking place because more and more and more people are bowing their hearts before God. Because when we put prayer first, it makes a difference. Would you agree with me on that? It makes a difference. Secondly, when we put prayer first, it means that we understand our own humanity. What does that mean? Our weaknesses, our frailty. Come on, somebody. We're, we're, we're humans. We're, we're prone to make mistakes. You know that, right? Everybody here, your, your human body, your flesh, your self-life, your carnal life, it, it, when you pray, you begin to understand your limits. We're limited. I mean, no, we're limited. That's why Zechariah said, what? Not by might nor by power, but by my, by my spirit. There's something that happens when you and I get into prayer. We're moving past our human limitations. We're getting past our mistakes. We're getting past our frailties. And we're entering in to miracle territory. See, prayer helps us keep things in the right perspective. When we pray, somehow all our problems. Any of you got problems? If you don't have any problems, you can see me. I'll be right over here by the goalpost because I have enough. I can share them with everybody. I got enough to go around. But you know what happens when I go into prayer, that scripture that says, cast all your burdens on the Lord because the Lord will sustain you. There's something about prayer, going into prayer when you're burdened, going into prayer when you're in need, and going into prayer and understanding your own limits and frailties, but connecting with a God who is able to do the miracles that you need. Keeps it into perspective. Somehow, all the stuff that we're going through begins to pale in comparison to the God that we seek, right? Putting God first in prayer. One writer said this, if the people of God would live by the principle of putting God first through prayer, they would experience the supernatural presence of a holy God even more intimately. The super natural presence of a whole. You know what happened in the, in the Old Testament when, when the supernatural presence of God got around men? The Bible says that they fell down like dead men. The flesh begins to die in the presence of God. Our weaknesses begin to fall off in the presence of God. So we need to prioritize God. When we come together, I want to challenge us. When we come together, when we walk into this room, let's make it a priority 
to pray. Let's get here early. Let's make it a priority to pray. Let's worry about everything we got to worry about after the service, and let's focus on a holy God as we enter into the service. Can I hear you say amen? If you're with me, come on. If you're with me, come on. So Paul gives us four types of prayer right here. That's what we're going to look at. These four types of prayer that we all should be praying as a church. First of all, he says, first, there are supplications. Everybody say supplications. supplications. He gives four types of prayer. Because there's different meanings for these different kinds of prayer. The first one are supplications. And that, that's a word which means the request of the people. How many of you got things you want people to pray about? Right? How many of you got children that need Jesus? Right? Supplications means we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to pray for my children. Or, or how many of you want a better job? Or you're in need of a job? So a supplication would be when you come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me that I could get this job. I'm in need of it. Better hours, better pay. I could be, a, I could be used greater for the kingdom. He says, first of all, there's supplications, the request of the people. Do you know every week somebody sends a prayer request? Somebody will contact us either um, on Facebook or through the email or they'll leave a message on our phone or, or they'll tell somebody and, and the, it'll get to me. And right away, I call Brother Carlos. Thank God we have someone who's coordinating our prayer. We have someone who believes in prayer. I call Brother Carlos. He'll answer the phone. It doesn't matter where he's at. If he's at work, he'll answer the phone. And I'll say, Carlos, I need you to pray for this person. I need this, this prayer request. And as sure as enough, what Carlos does, he sends it out to all the life groups. And we start praying for your needs. Come on, somebody. Every week, there's prayer requests prayed for here in the local church. Those are supplications. Do you have any needs? Well, make sure when you come in with those needs that you let your life group leader, you let the ushers, you write it down on a paper, throw it in the offering basket, you see the greeters, and you write it down, and we will pray for you. How many of you believe in praying for your brother and sister? These are real-life situations. This, this could be... Life or death or something. This could mean if someone's going to continue going forward with the Lord or stop. So he says supplications. Because there's people that are going through heartache that you might not even know about. You might not know about it. They're going through different struggles that we might not know about. They're having pain or pressure that we might not know about. But we can get a prayer request. And when we get it, we can get involved in their life through prayer. So let's pray. Paul says, let's pray first for supplications. Pray for one another's needs. When people ask for prayer, watch this, catch this. When people ask for prayer, they're sharing their needs to us, with us, so we can, as Paul wrote to the Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You might say, Man, Pastor, I got my own burdens. My cross is heavy. How many of you say your cross is heavy? It's never as heavy as Jesus's. We got our own burdens, right? But you know what happens when I'm praying for other people and I got my own issues, my own struggles, my own needs? Somehow, when I'm praying for this person or, or I'm lifting up that person, God's sending someone to help me meet my need. Has that ever happened to you? That's, that's happened to me over and over and over and over. So when you hear somebody's prayer request, when we're, when we're praying for different things from the pulpit before the service or during the time of uh, prayer petitions, write down the need. Write it down. Pray throughout the week. You take it home with you. Can you imagine the, the army of prayer we can mobilize? When we pray throughout the week in our own individual prayer, to, in our life groups, life group leaders, the, 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 the gang, the, the victory homes, when everybody's praying for our needs, for one another's needs, can you imagine the power of God being poured out? I want to see that happen. Do you? 
The second type of prayer Paul talked about here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he uses the word prayers. He says supplications and prayers. That's kind of a general word we use. It doesn't make sense to us in the English, but in the Greek translation, it, it meant a special, a special request which God alone can meet. A special request which, which God alone can meet. Watch this. There's some things we can pray for, right? And other people can help us with. Come on, you say, pray for me. Hey, we're going to pray for someone that needs a job this morning, right? We're going to pray for so-and-so. Then all of a sudden, someone over here is saying, hey, they're hiring at my job. I heard, hey, I heard them praying for you. Hey, give, me your, give me your info, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give your word to my supervisor, and then I'll, I'll let you know you can come down. Have you ever had someone tell you that? See, that's supplications, but there's some things, there's some types of prayers that only God alone can meet. When we pray for salvation, there's nothing I can do to save people. I can witness to them, but it's the Holy Spirit that'll convict them. It's the, it's the Father that'll draw them. Can I hear you say? It's the blood that'll cleanse them. There's some prayers that only God can meet. Jesus said it like this, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Some of us, we need to start praying for the impossible to become possible. We need to start praying for those things that are so big and so, we need to pray great prayers of faith. Can I hear you say amen? There's some requests that only God can meet. There's, there, there's someone here today that has a need, but we can pray for it, but we know only God. That's a type of prayer where we have to tap in by faith to the miracle working. We have to believe with them, and we have to pray with them day after day after day after day after, and never get tired of praying until God answers it. I know some people that have prayed for their loved ones 20, 30 years. And they might get weary and well-doing. But how many know God will always come through and answer prayer? So we have to bring those before the Lord and pray about them. Those impossible, we need to start praying for impossible situations. The third form of prayer that Paul talks about is intercessions. He says intercessions. This is a word that has other people in view. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm not, I can't intercede for myself, but I can intercede for you. It has, it, 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 it's a type of prayer that has other people's needs before your own. Come on, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can pray selfishly. I can pray for my needs, my family, my wants, my desires. But when it comes down to intercessory prayer, intercessory prayer is a very unselfish type of prayer. It means an intimate petition made by a friend to a king on behalf of someone else. Come on, how many know we have access to the king? I said, how many know you have access to the king? And when you pray that inner prayer of intercession, you're taking somebody else's needs, somebody else's struggle, somebody else's pain, and you're taking it into the presence of an almighty God. I believe that's the most beautiful form of corporate prayer, is when we can all come together as a church, and because we're the children of God, we can lift up the needs of one another to the Lord. Come on, somebody, come on, come on. We can make petitions on behalf of other people. I believe that type of prayer touches your heart because when you're praying for other people, it, it, it just, it, it's humbling, it, it breaks you, you begin to feel, you begin to feel their struggle. It's like when Jesus, the Bible says when Jesus looked at the multitude, he had compassion on them because he saw them as 
scattered like sheep without a shepherd. You know what happened to Jesus? He began to feel their lostness. He began to feel their loneliness. He began to feel their hurt. And how did that happen? Jesus was a man of prayer. He was a man that got early in the morning, the Bible says, Jesus would get up way before daylight and he would go to a solitary place and there he would pray. See, when we intercede for one another, we begin to feel their pain. We drive down the street and we see needy people. Come on, somebody. Man, I was reading in our devotion this morning in my Bible reading. It was talking about the parable of the talents. I don't know if some of you are reading the same, the same uh, 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 devotion that I'm doing, but it talked about the parable of the talents, how God gives us different gifts. He gives us different types of financial blessings. He gives us material blessings. He positions us. But he gives us all that so we can use it to touch hurting and broken people's lives. Intercessory prayer is when we make petitions on behalf of others. The fourth kind of prayer. The fourth kind of prayer that Paul said. He said supplications prayers, intercessions, right? And then he says, and thanksgiving. And thank. How many of you pray and thank God for your brother or your sister? How many of you pray and thank God for your life group leader, for your home director? You know, I still, I, I've been out of the home 35 years. And I still thank God in prayer for my home director, for my pastor who has gone on to be with, I still have a personal gratitude in my heart for the people that God used in my life. And we all should be like that. He says, and thanksgiving. When we gather together as a church, we need to give thanks to God for one another. We need to give thanks to God that we're able to gather. We need to give thanks for God that there was a door open that we could come in and get saved. You know, even in our song service, we're not just singing songs. We're worshiping God. That's a form of prayer. That song service is a form of prayer where we're worshiping God. And you listen to the words of those songs. There's some songs that I, man, man they touch my heart. When we sing that song, I Surrender All, oh, man, I just start thinking, man, all that God has done. God, I just want to surrender. I just want to submit to you, right? When we, start, when, we start, when we start singing songs of God's faithfulness, that he's faithful, and I, oh, and I start thinking, man, all the different times in my life where I thought I wasn't going to make it, but God came through. That's why singing and worshiping the Lord has always been a priority in this church. We, we value the music ministry. We value the musicians. We value the singers because they're leading us into the presence of God. But it's through song. But it's a form of praise. It's a form of prayer and worship. Come on, somebody. Give the music ministry. Come on, give them. Man, they work hard. They work hard. Those songs sometimes just touch. Some of them hit. Some of them hit. They hit deeply. And they touch us and they break. Come on, how many of you got a song that when they sing it, you say, man, that's my jam. That's my, I got saved on that song. Huh? I got saved on that song. Look at verse 3 and 4. Put that up. Verse 3 and 4. We're almost done. We're almost done. 1 Timothy 1, 2, ver, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. It should be 2. My mistake. Look at what it says. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of God. Of the truth. What is good? What is good, Pastor? He says, This is good when the church 
prays together. When the people of God pray together, Paul declares, that's good. That's good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Wow. Verse 4 says, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So here, watch this real quick. The results of public prayer. The results, what happens? What happens when the people of God prioritize prayer? Worship team, you guys can go ahead and get ready and come on up. The results of prayer in our church, corporate prayer, first of all, is good and pleasing to God. When we come together, when we gather together as a church and we worship, know this, that that is a good thing. Know this, that that is pleasing. You're, you're, you're no more pleasing to God than you are when you're bowing your heart to God in prayer and in worship. It's a good thing. Tell your neighbor, it's good and pleasing to God. Man, I, I believe when we Step out when we finish up a prayer meeting. I believe God the Father, Jesus is just looking down from heaven and they say, Look at my children, look at my son, look at my daughter. Man, they're praying. It's like you when your kid hits a home run or scores a touchdown or brings home a, a, a report card with straight A. I say, Man, that's how God looks at us. Look at my children, they're praying. It's good and pleasing. It's good and pleasing. Secondly, he says that he desires all people to be saved. I believe corporate prayer is a gateway. It's a gateway for the salvation of others. When the church prays, when the church prays, when the church prays, it opens the gates of salvation to others. That's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to pray for our unsaved loved ones. Come on, we're going we're gonna to pray for our unsaved loved ones, and we're going to pray for the lost and hurting people of our city. So I want you to stand with me.